It's a pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Paul DeMartini, uh, uh, formerly, well, from many places in, in, within the energy industry, uh, most recently Cisco and, and now a consultant, uh, Newport, uh, Newport Consulting. consulting yeah. Newport Consulting. And uh, so Paul put together a, uh, a panel of experts from industry who will prevent, uh, present some of their views, and then there'll be time for questions. And I hope that uh, you, you all, uh, you know, uh, you know, ask some, ask some, I don't know, provocative questions. Let's just get a discussion going. Uh, um. Great. Uh, I'm, I'm good. Uh, oh, yeah. That's yeah. Right, that's right. So, uh, so I'd like to introduce the panel. Uh, we have Mike Rowan from uh, Duke Energy, who's been working on these uh, issues there at uh, Duke in terms of looking at control systems, distributed uh, systems, uh, with respect to how we think about integrating uh, distributed energy resources. Jeff Taft, Chief, Chief Architect at Cisco's Connected Energy Networks Group, uh, distinguished engineer at, at uh, Cisco. Uh, uh, David Sun, uh, Chief Scientist at Alstom uh, Grid, who's been looking at these questions on uh, the convergence of uh, economic market economics and, and control systems. And Eric Gunther, uh, with Enernex, he's the Chief Technology Officer and, and CEO. Uh, Eric is also Chair of the Gridwise Architecture Council, which is a DOE-sponsored uh, group that is uh, looking at, uh, in addition to interoperability questions, looking at something uh, we call transactive energy, which I'll, I'll introduce here in a second. And uh, uh, in addition to the consulting work I do, I'm also uh, a member of the Gridwise Architecture Council uh, and also affiliated with uh, Caltech. So I've been also looking at these questions. So uh, as an introduction, I thought I'd tee up at least what uh, at the Gridwise Architecture Council, uh, which is comprised of a variety of different uh, stakeholders uh, within the industry, uh, thinking about these questions and uh, considerations, which I think will then uh, tee up the, uh, the various panel member uh, conversation. So uh, the first from, uh, from at least a Gridwise Architecture Council perspective, what we've been looking at is very much what uh, has been talked about this morning uh, which is this uh, convergence of uh, both the economic side, the, the market economic side, uh, valuation and, and, uh, and signaling of economic values to distributed resources in a way that um, uh, is able to integrate uh, these resources from the customer, the, the distributed resources. And we look at that very broadly, so it's not just distributed generation, but also uh, potentially storage uh, of any type, uh, to Sean's point, so that includes uh, building automation and control, industrial automation control, uh, and uh, home energy management, uh, as well as electric vehicle and, and any uh, uh, responsive demand, uh, how that might uh, shape up. So we're trying to look at uh, uh, these questions. Uh, we have an architectural framework uh, that was developed some years ago that was uh, started as a, as a framing uh, for uh, the, the thoughts around interoperability and this, uh, this stack uh, starts up at the economic regulatory policy, uh, business objectives, business procedures, business content, semantic understanding, syntactic uh, uh, interoperability, network interoperability, and basic connectivity. Uh, a way to think about it in the context of transactive energy are market designs, uh, business models and pricing schemes, uh, transactive controls. This could also be contracting mechanisms as well. Um, and then cyber physical infrastructure. So trying to think across those uh, in a way to, th to think about how we integrate all this. Uh, we also uh, very much are focused on these questions that have been raised this morning. I think John highlighted, which is on one dimension, uh, we're dealing with uh, very much uh, sort of spatial issues in terms of how do we think about coordination of, of various uh, resources across different uh, geospatial considerations. Uh, as well as time dimensions. Uh, this time dimension is a real challenge because of the number of order of magnitude uh, uh, across this that we try to coordinate in uh, the electric power system. And as we move away from just a reliance on reserves and move more towards the integration of all these resources, uh, this becomes really important to understand on both of these the implications of trying to do that. The geospatial sometimes we think about from transmission is across a region as Bill had mentioned today, but the other dimension that isn't often talked about is the coordination as we think about going forward, uh, not just uh, horizontally, but also vertically, uh, and the integration and how we think about the interplay between uh, the customer, the distribution system, and the bulk power system, uh, because that dimension also comes into play. Uh, the other thing which, although we talk about often in the smart grid, and Bill, you mentioned this this morning, is often the cyber network and the 
electric network, and sometimes uh, transactive energy tends to focus on the energy markets and the electric network, and by extension the customer. But the other piece that uh, Jeff and I have been talking about for some time, which is the emerging role that the social networks will start to play into this mix, uh, which actually has a whole other dimension to these ideas of what does collaborative mean, because that can be a beneficial collaborative, but can also be uh, a not so beneficial collaborative in terms of how that might happen. Uh, so also understanding how we think about the engagement of the customer on that basis as well. Um, the other thing that is starting to emerge in terms of the complexity that we need to think about is often we have simplified models in thinking about what the relationship in terms of the economic, whether it's a bilateral contract or a pricing mechanism, say between the bulk power system and the customer or energy services provider and a customer, maybe a distribution company and the, and the, op and the customer or an energy provider in terms of uh, commodity and the customer. And the reality is all of these have a relationship potentially with the customer. And there's a good example in Texas that Encore is showing that as they're starting to implement some of the systems there to, uh, to take advantage of this opportunity, uh, they're actually having to try and sort out all these relationships because each one of these has an economic optimization, uh, including the customer zone, uh, that has to potentially try and tap into the same resource. So how do we think about a scheme that uh, can resolve all that too, as if it wasn't already complicated. Um, so in simple form, uh, we are trying to do both the engineering uh, and the economic, as, as was John was pointing out, in a way that deals with markets, handles the grid operation piece, you know, we're not gonna ignore Kirkhoff, uh, but also the customer dimension. And do it in a way that um, tries to organize that, but also allows for uh, sort of self-optimization at, at multiple levels. Um, we are also recognizing that there are various values that could be derived from distributed resources over different time dimensions, uh, the different layers from generation, transmission, distribution, and the end consumer uh, that are available. Not all are available today in terms of exposed, in terms of being able to be monetized, but there are greater value than just at the bulk power system. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, David Sun to uh, kick us off. Thank you, Bob. The, uh, do, I, do I advance on this? This mouse is connected? Or? Yeah, I'll just pull up the deck. Hello, I'm David Sun. I'm very happy to be here to be a wake up alarm clock for our dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try to be loud and uh, hopefully not too provocative. Uh, uh, I, I'm trained as an engineer, a power engineer. So, control and, and, and economist, and now I have a power engineer. But my love is in, besides power, is in uh, math and optimization. Uh, with these two, I was able to uh, have a great time, had a great time in, in, in playing on the wholesale deregulation markets. Now, currently, I'm involved in doing distributed energy resource in a number of different facets. As Paul mentioned, it's, 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 it's got fingers everywhere. So. That's why I can take my, my great time to come here and enjoy talking to many cross-disciplinary experts. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. With that, I'll do a, I have three PowerPoints. Oops. First of all, I'll give a, a broad context of the power industry and then point out where we're headed and what two particular challenges are. Between Edison and somewhere cell phone, we had a classic power system where we build the generators, we build the towers, we string the wires, and you buy the light bulbs, I buy the light bulbs, and power disconnected. So infrastructure was in place. And, and for whatever reason, this was a, a very good reason, it's a regulated industry. We pay the bill on the cost plus principle. Whatever my cost is as a power company, I charge a cost plus 10%. That's how we pay, that's how I pay my bill. That's a great days to start. And then in the mid 90s, there's a fundamental change to our industry <coughs> where restructuring took place, much like the truck industry, much like the telecom, but the power came in also. There is one or two industry behind power yet, I won't mention them, but we're, we're probably pretty late in coming to this restructured, structure, uh, restructured uh, industry, uh, structure, uh, business model. And there, restructuring does not take everywhere. It, take, it happened only at the wholesale level, for a number of reasons I won't go into today. 
But the fundamental impact of that is it moved from a cost-based to a price-based. It says, I no longer have the right to do everything as a vertically integrated utility. I'm obligated as a utility to provide wire services. But it's a common carrier service. Anyone can plug in fairly. So first of all, we let the big units come in, big wholesale players come in. That was great. So it changed the form that I have a captive audience. Now I have to earn my, my keeps. I got to compete. Now we're in this smart grid arena. It took that step one step further. It is now power to the people. Not just wholesale, there are other pieces coming in. Smart occurs not only at the top of the utility control room. Smart occurs in my fridge, in the wired devices that can make the line transmission look like 50 miles or 100 miles at the snap of a finger. Well, these are smart pieces. Right? They're coming in. But the key thing is they're getting smart, and they're getting many. So the challenge we face today with my next two slides, one is, why would I pay for that smart device? And two, if I do get, if that money does make sense to be spent, there will be a whole bunch of them. What do we do with the whole bunch of them? These are the two questions. Does it make business sense? And how do we manage them? So does it make business sense? Uh, this sounds a bit small. So these are the revenues that people talk about. Why would you invest in a battery, for example? How, how do you expect to get paid? All right, we list all these things that people know. You can read on your own. But what I also want to add here is look at these categories. You go to the internet. You say, how much do I get paid? Let's imagine I'm buying one megawatt, which is a pretty good battery, but it's nothing compared with the power plant. One megawatt class, a lithium ion, runs four megawatt hours. Right? Roughly figure one to two dollars per watt. So it's a one to two million dollar investment for lithium ion. Now you figure out how many years that would take. I mean, it lasts, not 40 years, all right? I'll leave you to guess how many years, but it's, it's, a, it's shorter. So in that, with a one million dollar investment, among these categories, I can take in $187,000 a year. And that's pretty optimistic. All right, so why should I invest? The investment, ve ve revenues, we know, investment venues we know today, the, 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 the financial revenues, are known here. And these numbers are fairly, I don't want to actually read it, but they're mixing our assumption, but it's reasonable. The story says here, if that's all the, number, if that's all the money I'm going to get, I will not invest. So one of our challenges is figure out how to make this investment worthwhile. We all believe in green stuff. We all believe in having good, good battery backup in my house when the power goes out, I'm covered. How expensive is it? Are we prepared to pay for it? Now suppose I'm prepared to pay for it. Then there will be a million of them little suckers. <laughs> how do we run them? It leads to a new paradigm, a multi-tier business paradigm. The big ISOs in the US today runs 100 gigawatts, 100 plus gigawatts. <coughs> one nuclear plant's one gigawatt. One nuclear unit is one gigawatt. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good size. And running 1,000 of these large generators is pretty hard. Every five minutes, we send a signal out. In fact, every two seconds, we send a signal out to keep it 60 hertz, all right? So this is it's doable. It's, it's not science fiction. People get challenged. How can you pick Bob instead of John? You better go back and defend to the SEC. Why you did that? And this is doable. Technology exists today. It's happening at RTOs, but only for wholesale. Now, when you look at 1,000 gigawatt, I mean, 1,000 megawatt, 1 gigawatt, think about how many light bulbs, right? So we have to manage that. And the only way to manage that is tier it through our hierarchical control. That's part of the subject today. So how do we do that? I don't mean technology-wise, but a business framework. We're thinking it's as a company, whatever you are, you would do physical operation and some kind of commercial operation. You're supposed to make money. And you're going to make money by doing some physical operation of a device. There's a communication between the two. As a power plant, I buy coal. So with a coal, I have a one expensive coal, a one cheap coal, and one expensive gas or oil. I'll give a schedule for my plants. Run it this way. Plant says, no, I'm sorry, I got a tube leak. I'll come back and say, adjust. Very simple business process. 
a commercial operation, physical operation. Very simple, single tier. All right. But when I have more than one tier, what happens? I have another tier now. As a power company, I'm reporting to a higher layer, RTO, ISO. That's what we, we, we structure the, the industry with. With that, we aggregate what I can do, what I like to do, to my upper layer boss. And this is aggregation. I have many devices, I have many air conditioners. How do I represent to the guy above, hey, I, I can turn the air conditioning on, and I got six air conditioners. At what price do I turn on? You tell the guy upstairs. How do you aggregate those devices? I think about a million light bulbs and six million cars. How do you aggregate that? Of course, it's not two tiers. It's any number of tiers. So Gainesville, Gainesville uh, aggregates to FP Florida Reliability Council, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we aggregate up. What's guy upstairs going to do with my information? He'll give me a grade. He will give me a schedule, a war. He award me something. You're on, you're off. When this guy gets on and off, what does he do? He goes, he's downstairs, guy says, you're on, you're off. And this thing continues to infinitum. So the heart to this multi-tier control is figure out how to aggregate and disaggregate. Nothing more. <coughs> of course, that's the PowerPoint. Thank you. <laughs> so Jeff. So I'm a, a chief architect for the Connected Energy Networks Business Unit in Cisco, and uh, despite the way that sounds, I'm not actually a networking guru. Cisco brought me on board because I've been working with the stuff that we more or less call smart group for a long time. Uh, I started focusing on that exclusively in 2001, when we didn't even use that phrase very much, and then we went through the phrase where we used it a lot, and now not so much again, because uh, you know utilities are kind of past that that sort of hype phase, and we're going to have all these glitzy gizmos and smart objects around, and are really refocusing a lot on grid modernization and operational excellence. So to some extent, we don't even see that term so much. My role there has to do with helping Cisco understand what communication networks need to be in order to uh, be useful to electric utilities. And that leads to the subject of what we've been talking about today. My background, by the way, is in electrical engineering, um, control systems, and signal processing, and, and uh, power systems. I worked for Westinghouse for a long time back when they made everything from uh, household circuit breakers to nuclear power plants and everything in between. So we got very interested in some of these issues around what was happening with changes to the power grid and uh, Paul uh, actually worked with us at Cisco for a time and he and I have been collaborating for a good while as you heard on some of this stuff and we started to think about why things were not getting the traction we kind of thought they should get. There's been a lot of great work on interoperability standards, um, a lot of architecture work which some of which I've personally uh, been a part of and lots of others and yet we don't really see this stuff going as, as, as fast or as deeply as we thought it might, and we wondered why that is. And so we started to think about some of these emerging control issues uh, that I'm going to talk about there. And what I'm going to talk about is not any particular control algorithm, well, a little bit later on, but more about the large-scale control structure of the entire power delivery chain, um, the ultra-large control framework, if you will. Earlier today, you heard some discussions, and right before uh, uh, lunch there, we talked about the fact that there is hidden coupling through the grid, right? Or about Kirchhoff's laws and all that. The fact of the matter is, those electrical physics rules are inviolable, and, you know, when we talk about the idea that there's a convergence of networks, um, and Paul talked about the convergence of four different kinds of networks, one of those is the power grid, that's the key network there. The next one, which is really important to Cisco, is information and communication technology networks. And then financial networks in the sense of markets and social networks. But that physical network is really important because you can't get away from it. And so if you don't take into account the fact that there's all kinds of interesting coupling, uh, no matter what your business models might be, and we've seen companies say, oh, I've got a disruptive business model for the utility industry. Watch this. I'm going to operate outside the regime of all that stuff and do clever things. Well, that doesn't last very long. You can do that at pilot scale, but when you start to do it at significant levels of penetration, problems crop up. Examples, interactions between volt-var regulation and demand response. 
um, interaction between conservation voltage reduction and solar photovoltaics. And we talked a little bit about demand response and markets and how those things can turn out to be unfortunately unstable in the control sense. So those things all matter and we start to think about does the control framework that exists out there enable us to use solutions for that? What if somebody wants to do a plug and play of a new kind of capability? How do they plug into the grid? It's one thing to have the ability to do electrical connection. It's another thing to be able to have a connection to the control systems and have that all work. So we think that there are implications around that for architecture in the very large scale for control systems and for uh, design and control itself and then our interest in communications. Next slide, please. There are lots of new instability sources, too. By the way, you know we're getting rid of some of the things that stabilize the grid. We have a lot of rotational inertia supplied by big spinning masses of metal, and we've kind of decided that maybe we should get rid of some of those. Some folks in California might see the effects of that early on because of the once through cooling regulation. It's going to cause some of those power plants along the coast to maybe go away. Um, and then all these other things that we're talking about at the distribution level, many of which are, in a sense, destabilizing, up to and including the use of markets. And we talked about, you heard earlier about flash crashes and all the rest of that. So if you inherently put a market into the control process, how do you know it's stable? How do you know when it's not going to be stable? And what kind of a control framework is it that, re that gives you the ability to put stabilizing controls in place? Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, I know this one's a little hard to read, but when I talk about it, you're going to see what I'm getting at here. This is one of my favorite slides, Emerging Structural Chaos. So I went looking for a diagram that shows the overall large-scale flow of control in the entire power delivery chain. And in this diagram, control more or less flows from top to bottom along those lines. Feedback paths are not shown. And you'll notice that it's more or less layer structure, but on the right-hand side, there are all these interesting curved red lines, many of which are bypassing some tiers in this structure. Most of those lines represent things that people are trying to do now to do these new functions we've been talking about. And fortunately, most of them are not really cemented in place through a lot of investment yet. But I view those as being emerging chaos, meaning that if those types of, of lines of control get cemented into place, it'll be much harder to solve the control problems than if we keep a more nearly layered hierarchical structure, which is the way things kind of started out. Now, from communications and networking design, we know the value of the layering paradigm uh, in terms of being able to let each layer do its job and more or less insulate lower layers from changes in upper layers and, and vice versa. And that doesn't mean that we're going to somehow mitigate the effects of the physics of the grid, but it does mean in terms of control, we have the opportunity to help structure things in such a way that we can be pretty clean about changes that we might want to make at one level versus what happens at another level. Next slide, please. So what we've said to the industry is maybe there's some things that we have to do, one being regularize that structure, another, another being introduced a layered optimization approach, and, and I'll talk about why that optimization, in my opinion, keeps turning up in, in a second, and then distribute the control. Okay, next slide, please. So regularize means basically get rid of those curved red lines, right? Clean this up. Let's go back to a cleanly layered structure. This also allows us to do a really efficient job with communications, by the way. So that would be the first step, and that's a large scale issue because it involves many different organizations, not just one. You can't just go to one place and say, hey, you should do this or do that, right? Next, please. Um, introduce layered optimization. This goes back to the concept of layering as, a, as a, uh, an architectural paradigm. And uh, some of the work that's being done there is really interesting because it allows you to take a large scale problem and say, I need to solve grid control. How's that for a large scale problem? <coughs> well, try to solve that in a centralized way with all this new stuff going on. <coughs> I noticed a while back that there was a real uptick in the literature in terms of the use of optimization techniques to solve a whole lot of small grid control problems at the distribution level. I got curious about why that was. Now, optimization stuff has been around a long time, and, and you know, people will tell you, uh, like David, how much work they've done in the last 20 years applying the stuff and where it works and where it doesn't work. But all of a sudden, there's all this stuff going on with the use of optimization, and it didn't seem to me that it was about getting optimal answers. 
But when you look at those papers, it's more a matter of traditional control techniques not giving you great ways to incorporate lots of constraints, multiple objectives, all those things that represent the complexity, but optimization tools give you ways to handle that. So it wasn't that the optimal answer was necessarily that much better than the sort of merely good answer. It was that it gave you a way to solve the problem at all. So um, that was what got me interested. And I saw a paper from China that talked about using network utility maximization Ironically, a technique that arose in the control of congestion in TCP IP networks, and we saw that people were beginning to apply that to grid control problems, and I've seen that in a bunch of different places uh, uh, now at different universities. Uh, and we looked at that and thought, you know what, we understand that from a networking perspective. How does that map onto that nice layered architecture they talked about there? And it looks like it maybe gives you the ability to take that giant problem grid control and break it down layer by layer to as many layers as you need and have all the pieces cooperate in the solution of the problem. And that's, I think, the important thing there is cooperate and yet at each level the control, the optimization can be selfish in the sense of wanting to use its own criteria, wanting to use its own goals and yet within the bounds set for it by the layers around it. The interesting thing about this technique when you break it down is that the way that these problems are synchronized is through one of two things, exchange of resources or exchange of prices. Right? So it tends to align with some of the things that people are thinking about in terms of transactive energy, for example. Okay. So the idea there then is to take that <coughs> approach and fit it to a distributed model, fit it to that hierarchy that we talked about. It's not just a matter of decentralized computing, it's a matter of distributed in the sense that you've got many pieces cooperating with each other, finding a simultaneous solution across all those levels, and running that continuously to get an endpoint. So we start to talk to the industry about that, and you know, again, our interest is in what does that mean for networking requirements, but um, in general, I think this is one of the things that will help stimulate the conversation, and I'm gonna stop right there. Thanks, Jeff. Dave, I can do you one better instead of your three slides, I'm gonna have zero slides. <laughs> so, my name is Mike Rowe and I'm with uh, Duke Energy. Glad to be here today. I've been with Duke since I graduated from University of Florida in 1985. So I'm a natural gator, uh, fourth, fifth generation gator. I had a relative who was here in 1905, the first year that uh, UF was in Gainesville. But I think in, in 28 years, this is the first time I've been back to the campus for a non-sporting event. <laughs> <laughs> and here for official purposes. But with the, uh, with the acquisition of Progress Energy that Duke is now in, in Florida, I'm looking forward to uh, getting here more often. I'd like to just make a few comments from a utility perspective. I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna use any talk technical in terms of the optimization and the, and, the, and the resources, but I just want to make some observations about what is going on in the utility industry to see how it fits in with the conversation we're having at this event. You know, at its core, the issue that's happening is over a hundred years, the utility industry was built around centralized power plants, one-way flow of electricity, very limited data exchange, um, and customers metering that and paying their bill. And that's what we've been doing for close to a hundred years. You know, the core issue is now we're moving from this centralized um, schematic or, or view of the grid to a distributed generation. Instead of all the electricity coming from centralized power plants the utility owns, what happens when all these distributed generation, whether it's customer PV or whether it's smaller uh, distributed generation that maybe even we own, uh, customer uh, generation of different sorts, fuel cells, micro CHP, any number of technologies, what happens now when that model changes? And it's not just an engineering standpoint. It's not just, now what do we do from engineering? It's operations. You know, what happens with our you know, fuse sizing? Are we, now the fuse doesn't blow when you have a fault because you have you know, current fed from a generation source. So you have all these operational issues. You have regulatory issues. You know, regulations were just not designed for 
uh, this type of model. And we really are stressing regulatory paradigms of what a utility means. How do you compensate utilities? Can utilities own things on the customer side of the meter? Instead of putting PV, a customer-owned PV on the roof, maybe it's a utility-owned PV on the roof. But that doesn't work well in a utility, in a regulatory paradigm that we have now. So we're doing some pilots and things like that today. But what about the business model paradigms? You want to start stressing a utility planner, start saying you don't need a, a nuclear plant in your IRP at some point in the future because we can have advanced demand response or PV is going to hit grid parity in an X year. And now you're going from the hard and fast standpoint of resource planning that we've known to grow and love and trust hard assets in the ground to having to make IRP decisions based on industry projections. You know, and somebody made the comment earlier about um, uncertainty and risk is not something utility industry does well. So we have all that going on, but it's, at its core is this centralized versus distrib distributed architecture of the production of, of electricity. And also as part of that, we're moving from historically generation has followed load. Load does what it does, and we need to manage our generation to follow that load with maybe some emergency events thrown in there from a DR standpoint. But now as we're looking at distributed generation, especially renewable, wind or solar, now we're saying, all right, wait a minute, how can load follow generation? So from a fundamental premise of generation following load to having to start thinking about load following generation, what does, that, what does that mean to us? And now you have those different value propositions that get created you know, from that other slide of 20 different ones. You know, that, that rapid response to production swings of, of solar intermittency. Also, and that does have value. Now, how do we do that? Do we do it with energy storage? Do we do it with advanced DR? Do we do it with something else? Some other things that are, that are impacting this whole discussion is the, the fragmentation of the utility industry. I mentioned Duke Energy uh, just acquired Progress Energy, and now the merged company is the largest electric utility in the United States. My response is, big deal. <laughs> you know, we have seven million households out of what, 110, 120 million households in this country. So here we are, the biggest player in the electric utility industry in the United States. We have maybe 6% of the, of the market. That's not enough scale to really move things on our own. So this fragmentation of the industry, how do we move forward when we have to get so many people to, to cooperate? And how we move from a time when this fragmentation of the utility industry, I, I think to a lot of people that benefited. You know, people like Alstom could sell their product to multiple utilities. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as we consolidate, uh oh, there's one less customer I can sell to. <laughs> now Alstom's good and there's more opportunity for you know, bigger contracts, but still, I would say there's a lot of people that have benefited from this fragmentation. But to get to where the goals of where we're trying to be, this fragmentation is going to be a, a hindrance. How do we get people a, a common view? As Duke's trying to create a view of smart grid and implement it, and somebody else is doing a different view, you know, th that creates issues. How do we, how do we get sc scale and scope to the standpoint of getting prices down? The fragmentation of regulation. You know, if you were to start with a clean sheet of paper today for the utility industry in the United States, I doubt that you would do it with the number of regula regulated entities we have. You know, whether it's the, the 50 states and NERC and CERC and FERC and, you know, you can go on and on with the different uh, acronyms of people who have an input into the regulation and utility uh, business. There are, you know, people like uh, the municipal agencies who have different regulation than investor-owned utility and the co-ops and the REAs have different uh, regulation requirements. So that fragmentation of the industry from regulation and the, the industry itself is something that impacts our ability to move forward with all these smart grid concepts and, and uh, infrastructure concepts. And I think what we'll, we'll be seeing some very interesting um, questions being asked. And I'll just give you one example and then I'll, then I'll close and we can go to, uh, on to the questions. But as an example, you know, maybe the kilowatt hour paradigm needs to change. You know, why do we bill on kilowatt hours? You know, if you think about it, at a residential level, we really don't use those kilowatt hours numbers for operating our system. You know, well, there's an aggregated, we use, we don't take your kilowatt hours off your bill and now let's punch those kilowatt hours and now we know how to operate that transformer when you operate the system. It's really not an input. Think of the, some of the things you do, you pay for now. For a lot of people, the utility bill, electric bill is third or fourth largest bill they pay. They pay more for their phone service, their cell phone service, than for their energy in most parts of the country. How do you pay for your, your cell phone bill? You pay based on minutes? 
<laughs> no, <laughs> you, you pay a flat fee. You know, 10 or 15, 10 or 15 years ago, your, your cell phone plan probably, all right, you figured out, all right, it's, I have time of use. I need to wait till 9 o'clock to pay for this bill. And all right, how many, how many minutes am I? And you were doing all kind of things. Where did the market take it from a customer standpoint? Give me a flat bill. That's what I want. How many of you, watch, how many of you pay for TV based on how many hours of TV you watch? No. So what does the grid look like in the future in terms of the, the, the business model that makes sense? You know, as we're talking about in the, in the future, is the utility not so much a deliverer of kilowatt hours as the provider of energy service, the connectivity and the management of the system to enable you to do the things you want to do? So I think there's going to be a lot of, of questions like that, a lot of paradigm shifts from both a utility operational standpoint, regulatory, legislative, a consumer, and it's, a, and it's an interesting time. So that's why there's no easy answers uh, right now. So thank you and we'll Next slide. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about what I call sort of pragmatic transactive energy. Um, uh, my company, uh, Enternex, we're an electric power research, engineering, and consulting firm. And I like to say I like to have fun, you know, three different ways. Uh, get involved on the research side to help think this crazy stuff up. Transactive energy, perversive, you know, pervasive PV, all this nifty stuff. So I get, have fun figuring out some of this stuff. Uh, from an engineering point of view, I then have to get people to help figure out how to actually implement it. And then, so a lot of fun solving really hard problems. And then after that, on the consulting side, once I figure it out, I get to make money and tell people how to do it over and over again. So I get to have fun three times on this stuff. So, um, uh, but what I'm gonna talk about today is sort of the beginning of that process uh, on the engineering piece, going from the research side to start to apply some of this on sort of the bleeding edge. Next slide, please. Um, uh, Paul mentioned the Gridwise Architecture Council. Uh, just I'll give you a plug for that, and there's a URL at the end. But a lot of the work that we're doing on the Gridwise Architecture Council is really to try and figure out what are some of the guiding principles on how to make this stuff work. What are the higher level architectural concepts and principles at a high level that we need in order to, uh, to make that uh, happen, both in, in public and private infrastructure. The example I'm going to give today is more on the private side of applying some of these technologies. Next. Uh, so some of the areas that we're working on in the council is in the general area of interoperability. In order to make all these complex systems work, uh, we have to make sure that they can communicate with each other and be electrically compatible as well as information system compatible in order to implement these control systems that break if we get them wrong uh, or work well together when we get them right. In either case, we need them to communicate and interoperate. So we're doing a lot of work there. And as we're going to see, or you've seen already, um, there's a lot of complexity. So manage the, co the complexity of these systems is a really big challenge. Uh, just keeping track of what it is we're trying to optimize for, how the optimizations change, managing the complexity control theories. And then sort of the one of the embodiments of that, and that we're working on closely, right, you know, carefully right now, is, is the transactive energy aspect. It's an aspect where we're having to use interoperable systems to implement transactive energy, and we've got to manage that complexity in a way to achieve the economic function and operate in the real world where those pesky laws of physics you know, might otherwise get in the way. Next. So um, one example that I'm working on right now is I'm working on a campus microgrid. So this is a, uh, not a, uh, uh, an education, I've, I've done some work on, uh, on UCSD's, uh, University of California, San Diego microgrid, but this new campus is a very large campus uh, owned by a, a, a large uh, uh, manufacturer of electronic goods and services that you all know, you know really well, I'm just not allowed to say their name. <laughs> but if you Google Cupertino campus, you'll find it. <laughs> um, the, uh, but uh, it should be the first item in the list. Um, the, uh, you know, and they're doing, uh, you know, uh, building a very large new building over a billion dollar effort and um, uh, have a number of objectives that they, you know, that they want to meet in this new facility. Uh, first of all, they want to be incredibly energy efficient. So the basic baseline is using some of the most energy efficient technologies out there. They'll be the largest um, uh, user of LED lighting, uh, more than four megawatts of LED lighting, for example. So energy efficiency and energy conservation is the first piece. Second, using renewable energy and integrating that into their mix. Uh, more than 10 megawatts of photovoltaics you know, will be on their roof. But they also, that, you know, the total load over 20 megawatts, they'll need to purchase renewable energy elsewhere 
And so direct access to energy uh, through, mar uh, through uh, purchasing energy, through a variety of market mechanisms in order to make up the balance of their load. Well, you know, one of the things that they also want to make sure is that they have to have a very reliable campus, a very reliable energy supply for a variety of, uh, variety of reasons I think I'll go to in, on the next page. And so in order to implementing the transactive energy piece, really we needed to address the bigger picture. Uh, and it turns out that a microgrid you know, is a better way to address all the business needs. So all this really nifty stuff we're talking about, transactive energy and all these nifty new technologies, um, you know, you can't just go and, you know, as much as I'd like to because I'm an engineer and just, you know, put it out there because it's cool. We've got to solve a business problem. And by bringing transactive energy together as a means to address the larger business problem is something that we're, we're looking at trying to do. Next slide. So, you know, some of the key business values. So what are the business values? So 100% renewable energy in order to meet their green objectives. And only they can value, you know, how much additional do we want to pay, you know, to address that. Um, and, well, the bottom line comes out to be, well, we want to do that, but we really do want to find a way to pay for it. So by combining a number of technologies, um, trying to find a way to make it pay for itself. So the concept is designed for all revenue opportunities that we can come up with. And we've seen a few listed uh, here earlier. I think David showed a, a bunch of different ones that are out there. Peak shaving, ancillary services, demand charge management, uh, being able to uh, sell your excess renewable capacity that may be available on the weekend back into the market, and a number of other opportunities. So it turns out that one of the best ways to do this is to really start looking at this transactive energy you know, concept, understanding on a continuous basis, you know, what is the value to others, what is the value to me, but from this larger picture point of view, you know, from a global point of view as opposed to just a device point of view. Um, in combination with this, however, we need this extremely high energy supply reliability. Sometimes, a lot of times, that conflicts with some of these other uh, desirements, if you will. Um, you know, sometimes having that highly reliable supply and a high quality supply, that interferes with maximizing getting the most out of our photovoltaic system, for example. So you know, there's a number of things that we have to juggle in order to solve the big picture, the large problem. So when we're talking about optimization, one of the interesting things is we're not optimizing for one thing. We're usually optimizing for multiple things at the same time. Oh, cool. Okay, I know how to do that multivariable optimization. Well, the difference you do is you don't know all the time which thing you're optimizing for when, and it's different stakeholders are changing their mind in a real time basis about what they want to optimize for. So it makes for a very interesting optimization problem and control problem. Next uh, slide. Um, the other key issue here, when you get into a real system, when you get outside of some pontification about all these nifty new things we want to do and these simple few block diagrams of a couple of different devices interacting, and you get to have to actually build one of these things, this is the pragmatic part I'm talking about, there's a lot of stuff that matters that you've got to integrate. You've got all the electrical system components, the basic electric infrastructure elements that communicate basic electric power switching devices, the sensors that are able to monitor their performance and whether you're going to overload them or not and protect those, uh, inverters for power conversion, be it with storage or photovoltaics or whatever other energy source. And then because we need a communications network to make this work together, we've got all the communication devices that we have to communicate and manage. So we've got all those, the generation sources themselves, and then the load control devices, things like building automation systems or individual load control devices. If we're going to do, uh, you know, operate in transactive energy, at times we have to, uh, you know, be able to change a, the behavior of a device, change the set point on the thermostat, or just turn something on or off, or change its duty cycles. So we have all those devices we have to communicate with. Uh, the, the power conversion devices, the inverters I mentioned earlier, that have attributes of them that we can use for some of the ancillary services, things like VAR control or power quality management, harmonic cancellation, uh, things of that nature. Human interface devices, you know, humans have to interact with this stuff. 
whether or not you really want them to actually directly interact, given people the illusion that they have control sometimes can be helpful. But, um, but uh, you, know, you know, status and, and likes, we have human interface devices we have to worry about, loggers, historians, databases, things that we need in order to figure out um, uh, you know, how we've performed, what we've done, and, and uh, in, in uh, facilities like this, being able to optimize how we might change the way things work in the future. And of course, we've got the whole host of both centralized and distributed controllers that are necessary, hopefully working in a well-architected manner without leapfrogging you know, tiers, as, uh, as Jeff has talked about, in, uh, you know, to make all this work. Next slide. So with that, you know, there's a lot of concerns. And the biggest part of the concern is, is many. Any competent engineer can glue a couple of systems together and make it work. So the centralized control model, we've been pretty darn good about doing that. We can glue those things together, we can pretty much organize uh, things in a siloed basis and, and, make it, and make it work. But doing so in a way that scales to a lot more devices than we've used to do, make it secure, make it manageable, um, and guess what, make the business case is a heck of a lot harder. So we've got all these devices. A whole bunch of physical networks, some of which we know, TCP IP based networks, some of which are proprietary. Uh, a lot of the building automation world is still proprietary, or some are what I call boutique. Those are, you know, they're, they're standardized, but they're not well known. They're tough to glue together. So we need gateways, and we rely on the performance of those. That adds uncertainty and chaos into things. Lots of different protocols and standards that change over time, and we have to manage. So we got all these points of interoperability we have to manage and all these points of security vulnerability that come into play. Um, but the, the big one again is the multiple simultaneous incompatible optimization functions across this broad stakeholder group that really makes this fun when you really have to actually try and build it. And uh, next slide, please. So anyway, I just wanted to, you know, we'll leave that, we can talk about it. Um, uh, just a plug for the Architecture Council, next slide. Uh, if you will, there, the, um, uh, a lot of the things that we're talking about, you know, here in the transactive energy, we're going to have a, uh, the first international conference on transactive energy in Portland, uh, uh, Oregon next year. So I thought I'd put in a, a plug for that. And, uh, and if you just Google Grinnell's Architecture Council, I thought I had a URL there, but you can, you can find GWAC. So I guess that'll Thanks, do it for now. Thanks. So with that, we'll open up to questions. Any, any questions on any of the, uh, the presentations? Yeah, we scared them. <laughs> um, I mean, so maybe, an, an, actually a question to a lot of you. So as a, maybe a naively optimistic control engineer, I feel like we could do it. I really, I, you know, I really do feel like if we could uh, you know, skid our hands on those uh, pool pumps and, uh, and HVAC systems and some batteries and, you know, I, I mean, uh, I, I really do feel like we, we could deal with a lot of the, uh, the control problems. There'd be some evolution because we don't, there's no theory, as John uh, Ledger pointed out, there's not really a good theory for distributed control, but we've done a great job so far. So I feel like the control problems we'd resolve, the business case, it makes me completely depressed. You know, the fact that we have these incredible resources in the sense of there is inherent flexibility and demand all over the place. Take Florida, the HVAC systems are incredibly flexible uh, uh, sources of, of power. The pool pumps, a million of them in Florida, incredibly flexible. But there's no business case at all. And is that hopeless? <laughs> that's that's question. That's my question. <laughs> Hopefully, you can cheer me up. <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll start. You know, the, the whole world with engineers would be easy. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> it would solve this problem. Or there wouldn't be a problem to begin with. I like that one. <laughs> um, but you're right. The, you know, frankly, the, the technical aspects of this are, are very doable. I mean, there's, there's challenges, but that's not the issue. The issue are, is the, the business models, the regulatory environment. The, and I, I think I commented earlier, the existing, the the existing inertia and the existing system, not just, uh, just the capacity that's out there, the amount of investment that's out there. You know, part of the case is, or if you were building it from scratch, it would be easy to justify, but you've got this inherent, very low cost, high reliable system, and there's no sense of urgency from a general consumer standpoint. I think it's one of the biggest, uh, the biggest issues to that. So I, th I, I would say that, you know, building on, uh, on Mike's point, I think there are two things. Uh, one is uh, we need to more clearly recognize the various values that are in the system 
uh, given that we've set out as policy in, in most of the United States, at least from a population standpoint, around uh, distributed and renewable energy, uh, that, uh, that there are these other services that are needed to both uh, help facilitate the market, uh, an efficient market, uh, but also from a grid operational standpoint. But those, many of those services was on that slide uh, are not yet exposed uh, to be able to monetize, which means that the value of that uh, demand response is maybe only seeing, uh, say, six of those services that, that I had on that chart of 22. Uh, so the question is, uh, how, do we, how do we expose those in a way uh, that, uh, that both the customer and, and third parties can monetize and others in the system can, can value? The other part that Mike talked about, I thought uh, rather well in his, in his uh, remarks, is that we are not starting from a greenfield. We are in this brownfield situation, and we've got structural changes across the board, uh, some of which are, uh, can be solved from an engineering standpoint, you know, uh, if you had a greenfield, uh, as has been talked about, relatively straightforward. But uh, let's take your, you know, the Florida demand and response. Florida Power and Light has the single biggest uh, AC cycling program uh, I think in the world, at, at just about a million customers uh, connected. Uh, the problem with most of those kind of system is, uh, I don't know, I don't know where their stance today, but most of the other ones in the U.S. are all uh, uh, based on paging, uh, one-way paging communication that were designed for reliability, not any of this economic uh, dispatch kind of uh, idea, and certainly not without any feedback mechanism. You don't even know, in most cases, uh, somebody could put tinfoil uh, literally over the uh, antenna or ripped off the antenna. You don't know if they're communicating. You don't know, uh, in some cases, the metering's not there at a granular le level to know whether it's responding. Uh, so all these things that I think, John, you touched on in terms of information that would be needed uh, is missing with some of those. So, how w so what would you change to do that? Well, the problem is it's going to cost to upgrade those systems or evolve those maybe into a smart thermostat type program that some have been doing. Uh, but then you got to have the cost to be able to, you got to have the economic justification to do so. So it, it's kind of inherent in that, uh, and as Mike also pointed out, then the regulatory structure, because right now in some cases we got a winner-loser problem uh, in many cases, and we need to think about uh, those regulatory compacts that start to allow, you know, the proverbial win-win kind of uh, outcome, or at least get rid of the disincentives that, that are structurally in the way. Yeah, I want to sort of add a quick comment there, too. The utilities have done an unbelievably great job in what they were asked to do. Build all this massive infrastructure, make it easy to use. How many people do you know that when they operate a, a wall switch for light have any idea what goes on behind the scenes in order for that all to work? Is there anything more plug and play than an ordinary light bulb? Right? Everybody can do that. So they did exactly what they were asked to do and build it for reliability and it's been so reliable that nobody thinks about it unless it's not there. Um, I had a power outage in my home for two days this past summer, and you know you start to realize what it's like when it's not there. But you never think about that otherwise. Now we're asking them to do a whole bunch of new things, and completely change the reasons why the system should operate the way it should. So sometimes we talk about oh the utility industry has so much inertia. Well, look at the massive amount of things they created, and yeah, we're asking them to change all that mm -hmm. right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, one of, one of the things that has value to just add on the value you know proposition. One of the thing that's changing, and it alludes to you know what what you just mentioned there, is for the most part we have been uh, satisfied with the <coughs> large scale reliability of things. We you know, measure by 99.99 percent uptime. Most people, on average, you know, a couple hours or you know of outage, uh, and uh, you know, and and that's been great. But now with our instant gratification society, used to you, you can't you know operate for more than 15 minutes without your smartphone going and, and the like. You know the need, every, the need and desire to have energy is is so much that the when we do have a an event and like or a storm like a you know a Hurricane Sandy or whatever, um, you know the 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 way we value the reliability of the system once you're into a major event has become a lot more critical. So instead of just managing for the global reliability, we got to manage that. But now when big events happen we have to manage and, op and, and manage that differently than we've used to, you know, to manage it. Uh, and we have an opportunity, and that's one of the reasons this particular campus application exists. That's designed for business continuity you know, for a you know, three week plus outage due to an earthquake. Uh, and they've determined that it's worthwhile to manage that business continuity for these large events. So it's a different way of thinking and a new way of applying value than we traditionally have done with classic reliability. And also the value at a consumer 
standpoint, it's a, it's a little bit of a paradox because they value it more than ever, but then almost place no value of it. More than ever based on Sandy or you, as you mentioned, 15 minutes, but in terms of being willing to pay for it, no, no it's no. a right to, how to much have are you willing, Yeah, How much are you willing to pay to have one less outage per yeah. year or how much are you willing to pay for that outage to be um, you know, 50 minutes instead of two hours? The answer is always zero. But the expectation is there, yeah. you know, uh, you know, for when it happens to you. That's a really hard one to fix. That's a Stephen, you had a question. So, uh, two, two comments. One is that uh, thirty years ago, uh, education, about the education people asking the same question. I think they not know the answer. So the communication network and the power network has gone. Uh, started about around the same time in a very similar structure, and the, their growth has to have been very similar until about 20 years ago, when the communication network went through an architectural transformation and converged to the IP, and that changes everything. That changes not just the engineering infrastructure, but also the whole industry. The, the markets, the regulatory structures, and a tremendous change. Now, 30 years ago, I don't think anyone would have, would have predicted that, and in fact, uh, we the vision that was, uh, that was discussed 30 years ago about telecommunication was very different from the vision we have today, in many respects. And therefore, I think you perhaps it would be, if you ask the same question at that time, then the answer would be there's no business case. Uh, who would care about IP network? It's so unreliable. And in fact, when the internet started to develop, uh, people talked to AT&T and Bell Labs continuously and it has been dismissed. So who would be interested in such an unreliable network that provides uh, doubtful service uh, at all. So, um, and therefore, it, it would be, so, so what is the lesson? I think the lesson you said, um, sometimes we, we need to move forward before we know all the answer. But the way we move, move forward is we have to come up with something that would be, uh, I guess, what pe people call future proof. So, so one example, specific example of that is the one reason IP or the internet has this explosive growth is really its lay architecture, as, as um, uh, Jeff talked about and so on. And if you look at the, the lay architecture, one key feature of that is this IP, which is this algorithm thing that people talked about. And what, what is significant about IP is extremely simple. It, it provides no guarantee on the super you will get, the loss you will get, uh, it doesn't even guarantee delivery. But the simplicity of this is the thing that, that, you, that you define, that you constrain, that allows you to, to deconstrain every, everything else in your design space. So I think that kind of feature, that is if we want to design a new architecture, we will not be able to do it uh, by, by first figuring out all the answers. We have to be able to do it uh, without knowing all the answers that we would like to know but do it in a way that whatever the answer turns out to be, however things will evolve in the future, that the architecture will define, will be able to adapt, will be able to enhance that. So how do you do that is uh, unclear, but I think a lot of the discussion needs to be among these sort of evolvable, robust aspects rather than the, the optimality, the performance, uh, and, and so on. Uh, the second comment is, is on reliability. Again, it, it's tremendously re reliable, amazingly reliable, uh, the power network. But then you ask, uh, as, as John Ledger mentioned earlier, this 99.9999 thing. I'm sure there are sectors of the society and the industry would need that, but perhaps 90% of the users will not need that. And therefore, if we don't have these differentiated services, it's a tremendous cost of, uh, uh, to the detriment of the entire, entire system. So I think on the first one, Stephen, um, it's a really good point, and I think one of the areas that uh, and, and it'd be interesting from a regulatory policy uh, whether the folks here have been uh, discussing this, but uh, they're starting to have, and, and Mike touched on this, which is, so what is the regulatory uh, framework that allows for the innovation uh, and, and maybe some experimentation through investment uh, that, that would lead you to that outcome? Because the, the telecommunication industry had enough latitude to be able to make some bets when they clearly didn't know what the outcome was. And in talking with a number of the business executives that were involved in those decisions at the time, they did not have business cases that penciled out. Uh, they just were making bets and they made a decision to move in a direction. The problem in the current industry that we have to say, well, we're gonna go to the new, say a new IP type, uh, whatever that might be for the electric infrastructure, 
Uh, and by the way, just to put this into context, we're talking roughly in the United States uh, for distribution system alone, uh, something on the order of $700 billion is the bet that we're, you know, in terms of if you wanted to do something different uh, over the next 20 years. That's the estimate from the Edison Electric Institute in Brattle. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that the current construct doesn't uh, allow for that. So uh, if somebody wanted to make a, a, an innovative bet uh, and they were wrong, there's, a, there's an asymmetric payoff. There's no upside and all downside, which is, uh, which is not the kind of construct that allows you to, to be able to benefit from that. So I don't know, that might be an area of, of uh, focus for, for folks to look at. Uh, Mike, I think you were touching on some of this. Yeah, I mean, the, the asymmetric rulemaking is, if you're not familiar with what that is from Conte Utility, in that, other words, if it works out well, benefits go to ratepayers. If it doesn't turn out well, shareholders have to eat it. You know, so how many people are, how many companies are willing to make big investments there? Whereas the, the, the telecom, I was just listening to something earlier this week of you know, Verizon Wireless versus Verizon Landline. Verizon Landline loses money. Verizon uh, Wireless, you know, prints money. But that's where the, the innovation occurred, and that's largely unregulated comparatively to, uh, to landlines. The other interesting thing that came to mind as you were commenting on that in the, in the telecom, there's still, from a landline standpoint, there's still that obligation to serve. And the innovation was occurring in areas where the obligations were, were either didn't exist or, or much, more, much more latitude. Utilities are still operating in this obligation to serve mentality and you have to treat everybody the same and you can't differentiate service. And, and so those are some of the, the regulatory paradigms that really are gonna be stressed um, over the coming years if we're, if we're serious about uh, innovation and change. From an engineering point of view, it's also important to you know, look at the differences between the, the communication infrastructure and electric power infrastructure when you're making the comparison for what evolved and happened in the telecommunication area. In, the, in telecommunications, you, know, you, had a, you, know, you were able to overbuild, create completely parallel physical infrastructure to support some of that competition. Uh, and which you know is, is essentially impractical to do so on the electric side. You know, having uh, you know ten more parallel circuits and poles all over the place. You know, you can envision trying you know to do that. Uh, and uh, you know, so you know, there's a, a few, a, some of the not as many degrees of freedom as were possible in the telecom side. And you get into the the, the you know the cyber physical you know infrastructure aspects of things. The other challenge that you know, comes into play is uh, in, uh, when, in the utility infrastructure, when things fail, you know, we burn things down, things blow up, people die. <laughs> and um, and uh, you know, that, uh, you know, whereas if something goes wrong in the network, you drop a few packets, transaction doesn't get through, you know, or you're there just swearing at the machine because it's taken you know, five seconds instead of two for your transaction to come back. Um, so you know, th there are some additional complexities in the energy world because we're dealing with physical manifestation we're dealing with big things you can't overbuild they're there for a long time you know you're you're a router you'll replace every year much to cisco's you know uh, delight you know but uh, you know but a transformer is going to be there for 40 years okay and uh, so there's some different challenges that come into play because of that i think the other thing on your second part uh steven and we'll go to another question uh is uh, on the reliability. And um, I think it's important to separate the two issues in reliability. One has to do with sort of everyday sort of reliability, which the six nines uh, that John showed uh, sort of relate to, sort of the normal Sadie and you know, those kinds of, uh, those kind of metrics uh, that says only two hours out of the year versus the low probability high impact events uh, that uh, seem to be on the rise. If you look at any of the studies that are you know, that are out there uh, or, and some of the implications from climate change, not so much the, the frequency of events, but the intensity of the events are increasing. Uh, and so the discussion about what, what's the value of the, uh, you know, and how, what do we place in terms of the, you know, extreme event from a natural disaster, whether it's a storm or in the case of an earthquake uh, or tsunami type event, uh, how do we think about the system from that standpoint? Because that, from a design standpoint on the system, those are really almost two different considerations different. when, you know, uh, in some ways. There's some overlap, but there, there are also these other considerations that come into play. And I think people are only now just trying to get their head around because the normal sort of, I mean, this is an oversimplification, but the normal sort of expected value type analysis around that, trying to, even if you put a big number on, say, a Sandy at how many billion, say 40 billion or whatever the number turns out to be, times the probability of that event, 
uh, you're going to end up with not enough, you know, would justify doing all that. But that isn't probably the right way to be thinking about it, uh, or maybe not all the value has been taken into account. Uh, and this is something that uh, I think we, you know, as an industry, people are starting to really try and get their head around. Uh, yeah. If I could shift discussion a little bit, and uh, I'm, I w I'd like to start to criticizing, to criticize our host, Sean, because the title of the workshop is Interdisciplinary Workshop on Smart Grids Design and Implementation. And it's not truly interdisciplinary because we have here uh, engineers, con uh, control uh, people, and economies, but there is one uh, crucial uh, component missing, and this is to represent the customers. It means, I think, to be truly interdisciplinary, we, we would need social scientists. Yeah. And the reason about it is that re what really is new about smart grids is bringing customers into, into the line, because it's the, uh, the, the physical infrastructure of the grid has been around for a long time. Uh, information and control has been around for a long time, but it was just concentrated at the top level while bringing it down. But the new element is the customer, because utilities so far couldn't care less about the customer. It was there, they didn't understand them. The whole really new novelty about smart grid is bringing customers. Now, and unfortunately, we have to say that, well, basically, that the, again, John mentioned that this con uh, control view, which has give me control and I'll sort out all the problems. Economists say, give me the markets and I'll sort everything. Both are, I think, extremely arrogant because they, uh, they, they neglect what really people want. Mm -hmm. Now, if uh, uh, in all the engineering models and all the technical models which we've seen around, uh, it's always the customer is a black box which will have some input and prices and then there will be behavior. Rubbish. People don't behave like that and uh, this is so-called rational expectation of the behavior which has been dismissed in social science. People react to a variety of different ways, and prices are not the most important thing. There are other things. There are hundreds of different social, uh, social theories which explain people's behavior. So that's why I think if, if Sean organizes this workshop in the future, I would suggest that we really need to, uh, to, to ask a social scientist to be around us, sociologists, uh, psychologists, anthropologists, whatever, because this is one thing which we do not understand. I repeat, we are extremely arrogant and ignorant, and we need some knowledge about how people behave. Yes, we're engineers. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, I mean, that, I mean well, well said. I mean, yeah, this, yeah. this is part of the challenge, I think, uh, it, particularly when we get to this set of uh, questions is, uh, in fact, we were discussing it at a conference earlier this week, uh, part of the challenge is, uh, uh, in, in fact, there was a webinar yesterday uh, that uh, was between a, a combination of the Edison Electric Indu uh, Institute, which represents the investor-owned utilities, and the National Association of Regulatory uh, uh, Utility Commissions, uh, talking about the regulatory framework about rate design to be able to address some of this. Um, and the, the consumer advocate group uh, there were, uh, that was representing there talking, uh, the challenge is that in many cases, uh, the, the, some of the consumer advocate groups uh, uh, are not even uh, aware of the, the, the issues we're talking about. They, they, they're not on the radar screen. Uh, and in some cases, the customers yet uh, haven't seen a, a strong value proposition. And I'll, and I'll give you a classic example. I mean, we saw a presentation this week uh, from people in Texas. People like to always show uh, Texas as the example of pure competition in the United States, uh, you know, how it's all working well and, you know, customers are engaged and all this innovation with uh, services that are designed to the customer and all this. Uh, and the reality is uh, they've got very little traction going on. And you say, well, why? You know, you would think all this innovation. Well, part of the reason is um, that many of the people that are trying to sell to them um, are really coming out of the, the traditional centralized model that are very commodity oriented. So trying to figure and get their head around the, the value propositions that, uh, you know, that would tap into the, you know, the, the social scientists and the, the, the behavioral experts and, and tapping into people that are very good at marketing, not, not just using Amway techniques to, to reduce your churn or get your customer adoption, but really uh, tapping into the, the value proposition that would compel somebody or interest somebody in doing what you're saying. So I, th that area is really weak in this industry, uh, to your point, and uh, we, I think we would all do well from more of that input. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So, but the, so there's a huge gap between what we, are, we have discussed and uh, what you suggest. There's another gap uh, we haven't talked yet, but that's closer. Um, I think it, to reach your, your goal uh, takes many more years. 
Uh, another gap I haven't discussed is the software. So let's look, at, look back uh, at the uh, internet, the right? history of internet. Internet IP was created, was invented, uh, was invented in the 70s. It was not popular. Nobody used it except the uh, scientists. Great ideas, but not useful. When it actually changed the world until web browser and the HTTP and HTML, okay? Until these things can reach to the people, normal people, the web browser, your, your grandma can use it. And why I, iPad is so popular? Because baby can use it, and, and grandma can use it. Now, smart grid, we are talking about still at the level of telecom, the optical network level. It's far, from, it's far away from customers yet. So how to make the smart grid usable to, to the normal users? So that, that needs a, a software. So what I, uh, so according to this uh, um, analogy and observation, uh, I'm thinking whether it's possible to create something, some software, like an app store, it's an app store for smart grid. A customer, they can download an app to manage their home utilities smartly with a little bit policy change. So then with this app store, uh, software vendors, they can create apps. Okay, this is an app to save energy. This is an app to save uh, water. This is an app to, to, uh, to, uh, to serve the customer with a big land, uh, to serve the customer with uh, uh, high profile things. That's the app that makes smart grid close to the customers. And with, with that, then you can have more behaviors and other things. That make this, uh, so I, I call it it's a, it's a uh, cloud of cyber physical system, or a cloud of a smart grid. So we have apps and everything that you can actually, that make users, like a web browser, right? It's an app store that users browse the possible apps for my usage. That may probably I don't know whether it's possible or not. Oh, it's very possible, and we're, we're at the earliest stages of seeing, of proving exactly what you're, what you're talking about. Um, about a year ago, um, a project was started under the uh, uh, insistence, guidance, whatever, of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, called the Green Button you know, effort. And basically, this concept was that every consumer should have access, or on a third party on their behalf, if they so authorize it, to their energy usage information, so that an ecosystem of apps, you know, can uh, you know can evolve. And within a year of that starting, uh, we now have uh, there's uh, 70, 80 apps in just the iPhone App Store, Apple App Store, uh, that take advantage of this one standard that uh, we work to create in an incredibly short time frame called the Energy Service Provider Interface (SB). Uh, and I think we've got like. 60 some utilities now that you know, in one way or the other support it, but a core of about 20. And, and we're, we're seeing where that can happen. Um, you know, the trick is, is uh, trying to uh, find out what those well-defined points of interoperability are so that a, a, uh, 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 an ecosystem of, around information related energy can start to evolve. So there's an experiment, you know, essentially underway in, some, in, in many cases. It's driven, it was driven the ways that I don't like being driven. You know, basically a regulator said, you're gonna, you're gonna do this and then, uh, and then uh, implement and they will come. Well, you know, I hate when that happens, but you know, it's, it, it seems to be you know, working reasonably well as, a, as a, an example for you know, this aspect of things. So greenbuttondata.org, go take a look, greenbuttondata.org, and you can see that example. Uh, okay, I'll check it out. So. Um does that mean it only collect data, or does that actually control your smart meter? In this particular you know, scenario, whether you have a smart meter or not, um, if, you, if you happen to have a smart meter that captures interval data and the utility collects that, the utility or their software provider is able to make that inter information available in a standardized format that then you can give permission to a third party to, to download and use and make available through a variety of apps. 
Uh, that, so that's, I think that's, that's this particular narrow application. But just to, yeah. just to clarify, that's that's just to get the access to the consumption right. that the utility collects. Right. There are already All systems, already. both in the commercial, industrial, and at the residential level, that operate independent of the utility meter to be able to collect right. information and do analysis and have cloud-based systems All to do what you say. In fact, if you take a look at what Verizon has through uh, through their offering on their uh, Vios, uh, so they've got a packaged offering uh, as part of their solution to have an energy management uh, service. AT&T has an offer. Uh, 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 ADT, the security home security system, right. has something called Pulse, which allows you to uh, to be able to then control your thermostat and get information out of your household. So you know, over the last couple of years, and particularly this this year, uh, we've seen many more. Uh, third parties, as well as this ecosystem, build up around the green, uh, the green button uh, data that's available around exactly what you're talking about. And in the commercial <coughs> industrial, uh, part and parcel, this has been really been for, for ten time. years. Yeah. About, that's mature. You know, since since actually direct access started back in the, you know, in the '90s, uh, many people. Part of when direct access happened in the United States, many states had a provision to. Uh, to make metering a, a non-regular, uh, you know, monopoly service and open that up for third parties or to get that information. Yeah. Now, it hasn't been the cheapest thing, and I know Dave, uh, Dave kathan has been, uh, at FERC, been working with others to figure out how do we make that information, pulse information, or very short time cycle information, as John had mentioned, is necessary for some of the kinds of things we want to do uh, as, you know, or expose or have value created. Um, but yes, I think we're, we're heading down that road. More can be done, though. Okay. Okay. So my understanding real. is that it's collecting data, right? It's not control or optimize your pol according to your policy for there your third parties. Third party third systems parties for that. that. They, oh, third party, they can do you that. Want, yeah, so yeah. if you say, if I have a solar panel, I have a smart meter, I have uh, a wind, 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 wind turbine, so they can optimize, they can sell my energy to the there are several I mean, third parties. I could use my house as an example, but it's you know since I'm a geek, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, a bit of a, 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 a extreme example. But there are lots of third parties out there that can use that information to basically build a home, uh, you know, uh, uh, building or you know automation system that can act upon energy usage, sensed information, weather information, knowing what, you know, what the plan is for your PV, and optimize use. You can buy that today. The issue is, is it you know a value to? In general, those systems are sold to much you know the higher income you know obviously you know kind of folks that uh, can uh, you know, afford to do that or have other reasons beside economics to do it. And the other is, I mean, so we're to, I mean, just get real practical here, just to give you a sense of it. So you can do some optimization, and most of those systems, you're not, is particularly if you've got any sort of intermittent resources part of that mix, um, you can't operate in independently. So you can't manage 100 percent of your load. Uh, with those sort of diverse resources on any single site, whether it's a, a campus environment that Eric was talking about, a military base or whatever, without some other sort of uh, reciprocating engine type, uh, you know, uh, resource to balance that out. Um, and it also, those systems don't interact in a graceful way with the, the broader electric network on an uh, interconnected system as, you know, we've been talking about all day. That's where these other things start to get more, you know, complicated. You can do something like this, and these are great, uh, you know, advances. But now, how do we start to, you know, uh, get, you know, leverage that across and get benefits across the system from all that? Mike, you mentioned that, you know, Duke Energy is a small part of the whole energy system, but in your seven million houses, you have hundred percent market share. Right. Um, to so you have some incentives and some ability to, you know, jumpstart a lot of things. I'm wondering, you know, is Duke Energy working with home builders to try and get them to push energy innovations on to cust, you know, market them to customers on new building of houses? Because if we build houses the same old way, they're going to be here for another 50 years, yeah. and you know, we'll be stuck with a lot of expenses to modernize those houses to take advantage of these things. I'm wondering whether, you know, you're sort of moving forward on that now. I mean, we're, we're doing a number of things, but it, it does get back to that regulatory yeah. construct because, all right, if, if we work, if we spend money to help a builder use less of our product, what's the model? doesn't compute that. <laughs> what, what's, the, what's the model for us being competent? We're, we were definitely willing to do that, and we are doing that with energy efficiency programs, both residential and and uh, CNI, 
but that that regulatory construct is is not there in a in an innovative enough way to really make that go to another level. The other issue is that customers um, doing it doing it where customers can participate, but it almost has to be back of mind. The customers don't really want to think about energy. And back to the question uh, comment over here, uh, I think back to a to a um, uh, focus group we did a number of years ago and one of the comments from a customer who just has rung with me through the years is he said energy works for me I don't work for energy <laughs> you know the, the purpose that we have electricity is to make our life easier so having programs that I have to be actively involved in in order to do something that's supposed to make my that just doesn't that doesn't compute very well so how do we make things back of mind? How, uh, I mean, building codes, getting houses built the correct way to begin with, getting systems in place where customers don't have to think about a very important. A lot of that is built around the, uh, the, the regulatory construct. I mean, we, we are doing it like in North Carolina, we have a program where we install solar panels, 10 megawatts worth of solar panels on customer. We're actually renting rooftops, so we own the distributed generation instead of the customer having to do it. All right, let's investigate that model of, of utility ownership of that. Uh, and different energy efficiency programs, but it is very closely tied to the uh, to the regulatory construct. So it depends on what regulation each state uh, thinks is appropriate. There are some places in the country where you know it is an incentive for, or it is a value for the utility to improve energy efficiency, or whatever. In some areas, if they have they have highly constrained systems in some areas, mm -hmm. congestion, not enough capacity, and you make some of those decisions in order to defer capital investment. And that you know that can be a business decision, but that's you know really not you know it's that has to do with optimizing you know for that entity that utility and not for the customer. Again, the regulatory construct has got to evolve to you know uh, uh, achieve some of the things you're talking about. Well, yeah, the energy efficiency in that context yeah. actually does benefit the customer because it's reducing their bill, and right. that's where those rebate programs are designed around as well. But sure, but that's almost a side effect. It was proposed in order to solve the other problem, and you know the side effect is that you know that it gets it. Not, it's not the primary. Well, and that's why I threw out the uh, the comment in my opening comments about the kilowatt hour. It actually only erodes our revenue if kilowatt hour is our product. Yeah. Exactly. You know, if, if our product is something else, then, then it may right, make right, a lot stuff on the table. Right. Yeah. right. The, the discussion is really going towards what is, what, is, what is in there for me as a company? What is the business? Really, smart grids and their design and implementation look like a fantastic engineering challenge, design challenge, for a very vaguely dis, uh, defined objective. Because you really talk with people and everyone thinks of a different matter for smart grids and not necessarily responding to the needs of the people as you said uh, so will will it really will really be will it really be market driven at all or not uh, or will it be driven by regulation or, or, or not uh, that that is the, the main question for the future and in relation to that I have a question for, for David he He's, he, at the end, uh, discussed the, this, this problem of the functions, how to aggregate and disaggregate functions, and, and how do you go about it? Is, is it also related to the previous comment, a, a regulatory question? Is it a control question? What is it? Mm -hmm. well, well, first of all, I, I'd like to jump in on, the, on your first part of the question. Uh, I think Stephen started with a question. Uh, with the future, we need to have my energy. It's choices to the people. If I want five nines or three nines, it's my choice. And that has to be the basis for driving forward. And five nine, four nine of what? Kilowatt hour or something else? Mm -hmm. And today, how many of us look at our power bills on a month? I, there, I heard this one story. We look more, 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 more times at the, uh, uh, you don't look at your power bill. I mean, that's the bottom line. So well, I can invent the prettiest looking web app. I won't use it. It's like my VCR buttons. I won't use it. Right, so that's a reality. So as a consumer, we have the responsibility and obligation to declare what I want. Mm -hmm. And if I only want kilowatt hours, then boy, I've got all I wanted. It's cheap enough, it doesn't bother me. Right, so that's number one. And then back to the second question on aggregation, disaggregation. It is driven by exactly the business model of who we aggregate to. And, but regardless of that model, there is technology needed. And, 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 and this room, I think optimization uh, being a fairly common theme, it's a fundamental aspect 
of both aggregation and disaggregation. We often think of disaggregation, meaning optimal dispatch, as, as a way to go forward. But that's a trivial problem. Bit creation, the aggregation, that's a challenging problem. And that is, I think, is a complete unsolved problem. And since I have the floor, I'll take one more point. I think part of the reason I'm in person finding this meeting very attractive is not to be of a meeting with people here like yourself and, and friends. It's, it's great joy. That's why short vision is why I'm here. But the longer, more noble cause is I would like to come to university. So people will say, I would like to be a, in the power industry to the students. So the, the lower back half of the, the uh, audience, what I'm really going after. Mm -hmm. Join our industry. We may say this is a hard industry, horribly difficult problem to, to evolve, but there are so many places we can make change. So please join and tell your <laughs> friends to join our industry. It's a good yeah. recruitment speech. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Other question? Nice to hear a positive <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.